Hi, it's Jen from Shabby Fabrics. These darling projects on the set with me here and behind me are part of our Gnome is Where the Heart is Club. We uh, launched that actually about three, four weeks ago now at the time of this filming. And I had mentioned we were going to do some supporting video about all the steps that you need to do um, to take you from opening up your kit to what happens in between that and being able to display that on your table so that so many people, if you're beginners, gives you the knowledge and the confidence to be able to uh, be able to have fun and successfully make each of the projects. Well, we read your social media posts. Thank you for engaging with us, by the way, YouTube, Instagram, uh, Facebook, wherever that is. We read every single comment. We thank you for that. Keep engaging with us. Um, it helps us know what you want. And that's why I'm standing here right now. Uh, I read a few comments from people that said, I really like to watch those videos right now so I can know if this is within my capabilities to sign up for the program. I'm like, that's a great idea. So we are launching out our tutorial on this early so that you can watch this all the way through and, and you'll soon see, absolutely, there, even if you are very low experience, very little experience with quilting, you can absolutely do this. So it's gonna be a longer video. Get your favorite snacks, something to drink. Um, we'll try to break it up in sections. Maybe you wanna pause it, watch part today and watch part tomorrow. Uh, we're just gonna take you through all the steps um, and show you each of those in detail so you can see there's really no mystery here. It's just following a process. So with each of the projects, uh, of course, you'll be getting your pattern, your diagrams, your background fabrics, your border fabrics, all of those applique shapes are prefused and laser cut, um, and those go down in a certain arrangement. So let's just crack this open. Let's just start with what happens when we, what's the first thing we do? So as we look at our project, we can see they all have a background, they all have borders, and they have a design on top. So we wanna start with our background fabric. Each of them will always start with our background fabric. Now what's on set with me are really the things we use to create the project. And I'll kind of just touch on those as we go. It's gonna be easier for you to see me use them in real time versus me trying to explain what's to come. So the, what's, we'll first start working with here is the Creative Grid spinning mat. And I have something on the top called the spinning possibilities ruler. These are not have-to products to make, be successful at, at all. But these are the types of things, just like anything. You can either make cookie dough with a hand mixer or you can use an electric mixer, right? It's kind of the same idea. It's a lot more fun using an electric mixer. It's a lot faster and it actually gives you better results. This is kind of like that. So I'm gonna talk about these projects. You can see them and see if they fit in your sewing room and in your budget, of course. So the first thing you'll do with each of the kits that you get is you'll uh, open up your kit, which will have all the things we talked about, the pattern, your background fabric, your borders, your applique shapes, your binding, even your backing is included in each of these kits. And some have little embellishments, including this one here with Santa's little jingle belt on his hat. We couldn't resist that. So with your fabric, because it's had to be folded and shipped to you, every time it's gonna have some creases in it. So your first step and this is so intuitive if you've been quilting um, for a long time or even any length of time, you know you need to iron your fabric. So that's step one. I never know if the people watching these videos are just now discovering quilting or veteran quilters. So I'm gonna make, I'm just assuming it's, it's a very first time. So um, for if you're an experienced quilter, just bear with me because I wanna bring along our new quilters and help them be successful. So we'll be sure to give a good press of our background fabric and our border fabric because that's what we'll be using right away. Now we make sure that in your kit, your background fabric is always bigger than it needs to be. And I like that. I always like having a bigger piece um, to work with than something that's the exact size. So underneath the fabric here is the spinning possibilities ruler. This happens to be a nine inch ruler and is the size that you will cut your background fabric to. You could use other rulers to cut that nine inch, but the thing I love about this ruler 
is that once I place it on the fabric I, and on the spinning mat, I can just tr make a cut, turn, make a cut, and I never have to lift the fabric again. It's nice when, if you want the most precision, this is how you get it. So looking at the background, notice that this is a stripe. For many of the backgrounds that are not stripes, such as this one and here, this one, you can lay that fabric or the ruler down and make your cuts, and it's not as important that you are square. But notice, I could put this, because I have such a big piece of fabric, I could put this ruler down and make cuts, and this would measure nine and a half or nine inches, but the stripes would not be running up and down. So this is called fussy cutting. So I will choose whatever line I want. Maybe I want to line up with this stripe. And I'm going to line up my ruler with a stripe on my fabric and now make my cut based on that. That'll help my stripes be as vertical as possible. So that's the first thing I'd like to call your attention to. Anytime you're working with a background that has what's called directional fabric is just make sure you've got some real good alignment. I like that spot right there. So I'm going to make a cut. Now if I wasn't on a spinning mat, I would have to come here, come here, which is not safe, and please never cut under your arm. I've done it before. I've nicked the, my forearm. I still even have a scar there. Don't ever do that. If you find yourself doing that, just add a spinning mat to your cart and get it over with. It's so much safer. You don't want to risk that cut, cutting yourself. So I will rotate the mat. So I'm always cutting in a very natural orientation. Even this, I tend to kind of do this little bit of a bow. And certainly this is not even close to being natural or safe. So we'll just cut around. And now our background is perfectly cut and ready for borders. Important, very, very important. For 10 out of the 12 projects, there's 12 of course, one for every month, you would now simply add your side borders and your top and bottom border at that moment. However, for the December project, as well as our uh, March project with our rainbow, those actually go off that tucks into the seam allowance right here. Let me move to the diagram and this will become more apparent what I'm talking about. So let's just look at a diagram also included every month with your project. Let's take a quick study of our diagram and then we'll talk about why we're not able to add the borders to this just yet. And that's because this tree piece is going to extend in this corner beautifully. Then, and we'll iron that down and then we'll put our borders on. Let's look at our diagram. Our layout diagram that we create for you has you in our heart the whole time to help you see this is how the pieces go together. The numbers let you know that that is the numbering sequence. Number one is the Christmas tree and that goes down first, followed by piece number two, which is the star followed by three and four and so on and so forth. That's the layering sequence that will, if you follow that, will give you that presentation. And that makes sense, right? We have a Christmas tree here that the star can't go down first and then the Christmas tree on top. The, the tree has to go down first and then naturally the star is on the top that is covering the very top of the tree. That's what we're trying to help you understand. Many other patterns that I have, even at home, when I first fell in love with quilting and I was buying up patterns left and right, either don't even have a layout diagram, they don't have uh, these numbered, and I was kind of trying to kind of figure out the sequencing. This is very obvious. There's a tree and a star. But let's look at Santa. Not so obvious as what piece needs to go down next so that it builds from the back forward. So hopefully that makes sense to you. What else is on our diagram are solid lines and dashed lines. The line here, this frame, is what will be your background. It's helping you to know when you, when you lay your background down, kind of where that frame is. So there's that. The dash lines, as I talked about, are letting you know that that piece lies behind. 
So just like the top of that Christmas tree lies behind the star. It's again just helping you understand the visualization of how the pieces go together. So let's get back to what we talked about with both the December project as well as our March project with the rainbow kind of flowing right into that background. So let's look at that. With our Christmas tree piece, and this all had fusible webbing, you just simply crease the edge over, remove the paper, and I've done that with all of my pieces. There is really no other place for this Christmas tree to be than here, right? Normally you're going to take the diagram and put it on your light box and you're using that to go where should this be but notice this here this is sitting right in the corner and that's our very first piece so i have my iron right now at a medium heat so we're going to put only one of these shapes down and then we're going to be able to add our borders so let's just bring that to our wool pressing mat and we'll iron that down when I iron this down, I kind of hold the iron in position on a medium heat, four to six seconds, depending on you know, how much contact I have. If, if the piece is down, keeping in mind that we will end up stitching this down with our thread set. This is just to get this to the machine to do the machine applique. So don't think that longer is actually better Four to six seconds is the longest you would likely want to hold that iron into position. Now that that piece is down, now we'll go ahead and add our borders. Precision is very important right now. We want to make sure our backgrounds are cut cleanly, our borders are cut cleanly. I should have mentioned, if you don't have a fresh blade in the rotary cutter, it's a great way to kick off a new program to put a fresh blade in your rotary cutter and a fresh needle in the sewing machine. It's just bent pins you might have, get rid of them. It's just a, it's a, a nice reset, right? So we will put our side borders on first, placing those right side together and pinning. That spinning possibilities ruler certainly set me up for success. These pieces are just clicking right together. We use the two and a half by 12 and a half creative grid uh, ruler to cut our borders because it was big enough to accommodate all four borders. So I like to use a ruler that's as close to the sides of my borders as I can. I wouldn't want to use a big six and a half by 24 and a half. It's so awkward. It's so much easier to be accurate with a ruler that's actually technically smaller. So now I'll pin the other side as well. As I'm pinning, let's talk about thread for piecing. We, have our, we know we have our thread for machine applique, but when it comes to just sewing borders on, um, that's where I love to use the or, uh, Orofil. And the Carrera set, this is what this one is, it has white, gray, and black. For every piecing project I have ever done, I've never needed more than that. When you start to do applique, as we do, we love to bring in all these lovely threads, even some specialty metallic threads. That's fun. But for just piecework that we're doing, you don't need a, a big litany of colors. White, green, black is plenty. So if you don't have a Carrera set or a favorite thread set yet, maybe you're new, the Orofo Carrera is what you need every time. All right, I'm gonna head over to the sewing machine and now we need to sew very accurately with a quarter inch seam allowance. I've got a few guides on my machine that help me be true and keep, keep honest with that quarter inch seam allowance. This is the diagonal seam tape and this is called the seam guide. It comes on and off my machine. The pack I think has six in it. Basically, once you figure out where your quarter inch seam allowance is, we set it in position and I've kind of learned for me, it's on the right side of that black line right there. That's what I've just learned about my machine and where I set that tape. What this does is as I feed in my machine, there's a little bit of a ridge. It keeps me from going past that. So I tend to sew a little bit on the heavy side of a quarter inch. So this is helping me be honest.
And I'm going to turn up that heat to full hot and press to the outside. Adorable. These are on the uh, December project. These are a lot of Riley Blake fabrics, a few others mixed in, I can see. Um, I sure had a lot of fun picking the fabrics for this over, over the last literally couple of years. I've been collecting fabrics um, and waiting for the moment to roll out the program, do the video, and I just think these little gnomes are pretty adorable. All right, once we have the sides on, now comes the top and bottom border. Again, right sides together. I would pin this corner. I'm pinning in a diagonal and I'm staying back so that when I sew a quarter of an inch seam allowance, I'm not going over my pin. Pin your other side, your other end. Then I pin in the middle and sew. And I'll do the same thing on the opposite side. So we have a lot of territory to cover. So I'm just gonna go do that. When I come back, we're gonna talk about using the layout diagram, the light box, the apple fuse mat to pre-assemble. I keep talking about this. Now you're gonna see this in action. So let me get these borders on. I'll press them to the outside. We'll set that off to this outside and then, or off to the side. And then we're gonna start really dialing in this layout diagram and how does all this layering sequence work. I'll be right back as we move forward with our tutorial series. Okay, so now we have Christmas tree and we have borders on. Let's put that aside for now because we're going to bring out our light box. We're gonna get that heat back down to medium. And let's see what we have here. When you get your kit, some of the pieces are very, very small, like the knots on the bows. Don't throw away any of the fabric that you're kind of punching those shapes out of, just in case you end up missing something and you kind of discover it when you're putting it together. I've done this before where my very efficient husband, I, I punched all the things out, I thought, threw it in the trash and he happened to be taking the trash out. He was a great guy. And then I went to put it together like, I don't know, a couple hours later, and I was missing something, and the trash had already actually even been picked up. <laughs> so I ended up having to dig in my stash and kind of make do. So don't do what I did. Get your pieces out, and I get them kind of arranged in the group in which they're going to be happening. And it just helps you go, okay, I'm starting to see the sequence, and I get how this is going to happen. So I'm just going to pull, uh, put that up there for now. And we're going to use the Apple Fuse mat. This is from the Gypsy Quilter. There's two sizes actually. The small one is sufficient for this project, but if you are if you love applique the way I do, you're going to find uses for both the small and the larger mat. Just get them both. I like to use the mat that fits the project because the bigger one is taking up more of my workspace. But there's times when you're working with a big shape and this it's just exceeding the size of the apple fuse mat. But this one should work well for you throughout this club. So this should work uh, be the only one that you need. So getting back to our diagram, I'm not gonna worry about the star right now. Let's just look at Santa. Understanding what pieces go down and sometimes what happens is your view gets kind of blocked. So let's just work our way through that and figure out, okay, what, what happens when my view gets blocked? What, what do I do now? So three and four go down. That's piece three and piece four. And I'm glad that I've got this piece in my hand right now. This is a white fabric. And when you get this, it's going to feel thicker than normal to you. Why? Because we created two layers for you. We try to eliminate show through. Most of the beards are white, some are gray. We have a red beard for our March uh, gnome, but sometimes the, the color of the fabric behind shows through to the, to the beard so much that we double line that there's two fabrics fused together. If it feels thicker, don't try to take it apart. It's supposed to be like that to block out the show, to minimize the show through. All right, you get the idea of why that's there. So the sequencing that we will use is light box, 
the layout diagram and you can see that I could use this this way or turn my light box this way. This is the wafer one light box. I like to understand where my picture, how my picture will build. So I've got, you'll have your pattern cover. I just have a piece here for me to look at to help me understand my sequencing. But it's good to understand it and sometimes I even snap a photo so that I've got the photo because once this goes down, this grid that works a very special magic, and you'll see how it, it, may, it allows things to fuse together to become one without sticking to the mat. It's incredible. The downside is it makes it more difficult to see through to see what piece goes down next. That's why that photo is helpful. You just kind of have that there and you can refer to that if you need to. So I don't have my camera with me, my phone with me. So I can say, all right, I know that my pieces are going to be this and this, and then my hat's going to come next. And then it looks like uh, I'm going to have that and then my mustache and then my nose. So I'm just going to get that ready and I'm going to try to remember that. All right, so sequence is light box, layout diagram, Applefuse mat, the lights coming on, I might have to turn mine down just a touch, just because the overhead camera blows, can blow out. I love that about the wafer light box. This is the one. This is the smallest one they have. They have one, two, and three. Three is the largest. If I wanted to turn this way down, we'll see it dim, and I can turn it off. And when you turn it back on, it remembers where you were. So if you have like different light during the day, different light during the night, this is a light box you're going to love because you can change that as you, the light changes in the room and as you prefer. So I'm just going to move that down so I have a full view of my Santa. And we know that the first piece going down is his coat. Now the thing about our light box, and, and to date I've never found a light box that you can iron on. You always have to move. This is not glass, not, not tempered glass. You have to move. So the best arrangement that I have found is to either have your light box right next to an ironing board or a pressing mat, pressing, a wool pressing mat. However you need to do that, have that arrangement kind of figured out before you get the process rolling. So there's a tackiness to this mat right now that I can push this first piece down and it's not going anywhere at all. Great feature. That works as long as it's contacting with the mat. As we start layering fabric and you can't get to the mat anymore, that your fabric might slip around. But just know to help yourself out so things don't shift. Something's kind of holding still while you're getting going. You can push those pieces down to the mat and there's a tackiness to this mat. If it ever loses its tackiness, they have said you can run this to a cycle in your actual dishwasher and it'll be tacky again. Now, I've not tried that, but they have said that is absolutely true. So this is really a one-time purchase. Now, looking at Santa's beard, I can just see from the profile of my cutout that this will need to go here. Now, piece three is up here. And notice how that dash line is telling me I, I'm just putting those pieces in. It's like a puzzle. This is saying, go here. If you've ever, if you're, if you're like me and you remember paint by numbers kits, this is quilting by <laughs> applique by numbers. Now we've got piece number four. I believe this was next. And I see just enough of the sides to see this is what, where this goes. Now I can see through here that this is my mustache. I can see the outline of that right there and right there. And there's the, ah, and my nose is kind of right here, just like this. That's already cute. All right, now what do we do? I don't really want to do more parts than that right now. For me, that's enough for me. I'm just going to move this carefully over here I'm 
press straight down, straight down. If it makes you nervous, maybe you have a uh, iron at home. I've got these. We have a lot of iron where I live in, on a mountain. And I always worry about my machine kind of spitting iron, no matter if I try to use distilled water. I, I swear, somehow it still gets in there. <laughs> we have the June Taylor pressing sheet. And if you're nervous about white fabric being pressed, you can always just pick this up you're going to have a lot of reasons to use it. If you're more comfortable not having direct contact with your iron to this fabric, by all means, go ahead and do that. So I just wanted to mention that to you. Um, I definitely have those irons that just over time, next thing you know, you're thinking, it looks clean and it throws something out. So that, that is something that has ruined, I've ruined shirts actually doing that and not been able to get the kind of that iron stain out of it. Okay, you get the idea that now we have put our iron down. This is fusing together right now. All of those pieces are becoming one. Remember how I said I wasn't kind of comfortable doing more because I'm blind now. I can't do work here with the gift because I can't see it anymore. Here's the great news. You don't need to worry about doing that because you can do different sections at different times. What do I mean by that? While this is cooling down, let's go look at this arm, for example. We know that we have this arm and this cuff and this arm and this cuff. Let's just go do that as separate sections. I would lay this down. If I want to have that mitten and I want to have that on there, I can do that. In fact, I'm just going to put that one down, this mitten, glove, I don't know, what, what does Santa have? Gloves, mittens, I'm not sure. All I know is they're black every time. I've seen black, I've seen green. I don't, I don't think I've seen any other colors. So we can do that. We can just iron those elements down. You want to iron down sections in, in amounts you're comfortable with. You'll see how the puzzle will all fit together. Those are cooling down. Let's look at the gift. We can see how our gift here, as we look at this, has piece 9, piece 10, piece 11, and 12. I'm going to go work on that section. The main thing is just like here, you start with your lowest number and build it up, is if I'm like, I'm going to make the big gift. Okay, what are my pieces? 9, 10, 11, and 12. Start with 9. So we'll once again go back, get a different section that's not even been used. We'll lay that down. here. And this will fuse this whole thing together. Just like that. Okay, so let's go do that part. You get the idea. You kind of take this in small chunks. Small sections. Now, if you start running out of mat, no problem. The Santa we started with first has definitely cooled. You can remove that from the mat. Let's do that together so that you can see all of those pieces are now one. Back in the day, as we say, before all of this technology was invented and before people had layout diagrams, you just had a picture of the project. You had shapes that were reversed for fusible applique you would trace those, cut those, and you were just looking at a picture, kind of hoping to get the whole thing right. <laughs> and it was a little hit and miss, to be honest with you. Now, though, with this technology, I simply peel this back, and all of this is now one. This is the magic of the mat. There is zero residue 
on this map, nothing. And it's available to use again and again and again. We have been using the same Applefuse map for the last five years. <laughs> this is truly a one-time purchase. So I think our last element really is this other gift. And then we'll start putting some of our elements together, put the whole thing together. I think of all the things that I enjoy most about this process is just watching it come together so precisely. I like precision. I don't want to hope it's going to come out, right? You want to be assured if you've made an investment in a kit that it's going to look exactly like on the cover, right? If you're like me at Christmas time, every year I fall for those gingerbread houses that they have this perfectly decorated house. And not once have I been able to actually achieve that. And every year though, I keep hoping this is the year that I'm actually gonna be, have the skill to make my gingerbread house look just as darling as the one on the cover. Here's the difference. If you follow this procedure and you use these tools, you will get the results you're seeing on the cover. That's the difference. All right, we have our last little gift. Let's move that over. Iron it down. We'll let that cool while we remove the others. There. There and there. I think that er, I've been demonstrating this product for years and every time I'm just smiling because it's so cool. <laughs> You're going to love doing this. All right, let's look at what we have here. We've used our layout diagram. We took sections and chunks that we were comfortable with. Like, yep, I didn't want to go past his nose. I was like, I'm blind to the rest of this. Let's do those separately. You saw me do that. Now what are we going to do? This line here is representing the background that we created to have as our frame for our picture. So this will come back into play now. So as we turn our light box on, and again, I've had to turn mine down quite a bit so we don't look, blow that out. I'm gonna try to blow it, raise it. Hopefully it's not too bright for you and the overhead camera. I'm now kind of seeing my Christmas tree. Hopefully you can see that. Do you see that from above? See that outline? That's my tree. I wanna get back into my footprint. And as I look, there's my frame right there. I'm going to move it down ever so slightly. You get realigned. Beautiful. Now comes the pieces. So let's, let's look at, again, our arrangement of, OK. We obviously know that Santa needs to be coming on here. And you can either look at that photo you snapped of the layout, or you can peek at, okay, which, what's the next? We could certainly put his feet on. There's nothing else that would be interfering with that. If we put those on now, you can do that. Certain pieces, you know, this is, this is shoes. 17 and 18. Does it matter if you put the right shoe on versus the left? No. Certain pieces, it doesn't really matter how they go on. Others, it does matter. Like the star, right? The star can't be behind the Christmas tree. It's in the front of the Christmas tree. So sometimes that layering is, is insignificant. Other times, it's very significant. So let's put on his shoes. I don't want too many things moving on us right now. Let's just iron down Santa and the shoes so we don't have too many more moving parts. Okay, sometimes it can be hard to see through your, the density of that. Sometimes you have to go, pretty good. I think that's where it goes. That's just the reality of it. Remember how we double layered the beard so we didn't have as much of the red suit sewing through? Uh, showing through, that makes it even more difficult to see through to see your diagrams from behind. So sometimes 
you have to use that visual reference uh, of, of the photo of the project to put that where it would best be suited. We can understand that that's where the arm would be and we can see, sometimes I lift up, there we go. Sometimes I will lift up to know I am very close to where I need to be. I might say, okay, I see that this is mostly centered between his boots. I can see it's right between his, kind of right beneath his nose. Um, I wouldn't iron that down yet. I'd be bringing these into position to, to see, does this appear to be passable? Does that appear to be in the right juxtaposition? And if not, if you want to make changes, you just simply tweak that. I actually think that looks really good. Might move that up just a touch. I like where that's located. And we had one more piece left over here, our gift. We have our star. Notice how the gift, I can see it right there. I can see that just peeking through. I can see exactly where that goes. Just like that. And then, of course, we have our star at the very top. Let's take that and iron that down. So cute. Now, notice the metallic. Yes, we could not resist. About half of these projects have a little bit of a metallic something in there. And that's why in your thread set option, if you didn't pick that up when you signed up for the club, just get it. it you're going to be so happy you have that. Um, it's so nice when you get ready to do a project and you're like, you know what, I have everything I need. I can just settle into it, whether it's midnight or eight in the morning or whenever you want to sew and create and have fun and you have everything you need. We, the reason that we uh, included two of the metallic threads, we have a gold and a silver, is just because of all the little metallic, about half of these have that in there. So now we have this done. You're like, awesome. <laughs> now what's next? Okay, this is where we kind of move on to the next section. We're really done at this point with our Applifuse mat. We're done with our light box, our layout diagram. Certain things are we're now done and we're ready to move on to the next phase. Remember how I mentioned in your kit, you have your backing fabric. Well, of course, there's something in between the assembled top and the back. You could be using batting. You could be using single-sided fusible fleece or double-sided fusible fleece, which is what I have with me today. So I'm gonna clean up the table just a bit we are literally going to do this together. We're gonna to sew stuff together. I wanna to take you through the full journey of now doing machine uh, applique. So that may be new to you. I wanna show you how that's done. That's when the beautiful thread set comes into play. So let me get cleaned up just a touch as we continue learning about how we make our cute little projects for our gnome club. So I am back now. We're ready to jump into, what do we do with this cute little quilt top? little block here to turn it into that. As I mentioned, you could use batting. We love to use fusible fleece, and my favorite is actually double-sided fusible fleece. Let, let's talk about the more common fusible fleece, which is fusible on just one side. You'll get your background in your kit. You wanna have your fusible fleece or batting or whatever you're using bigger than what's needed because it's always nice to have just that bigger background um, I cut my fusible fleece a little bit uh, snugger here just because I didn't want to have my iron having to not, you know, touch that. But you could certainly cut your fusible fleece to be the same size as the backing, however you want to do that. Now, this happens to be double-sided so that I, when I iron this, this is glued to this and this is glued to that. Fantastic. If you're a person that likes, I don't like fusible anything. I love to use batting. I don't want fusible products. Clover Wonder Pins is a newer product. It's been on the market about a year and a half maybe. In the day when I do some of my own projects where I did a little bit of my own little machine quilting, I would pin the layers together. I'd open up my junk drawer. You all, you all know what I'm talking about if you're a seasoned quilter. And I hunted for 
any safety pins I could find, any size, any variety, sharpness, wonder pins are the solution. We no longer have to dig in the junk drawers. These are great sharp little pins that if you want to be able to sandwich those layers together, these go in beautifully. You have a nice box there that should get a small project done. You're just going to pin in various sections. I like to just have all my layers fused together so I don't have to even use wonder pins and nothing shifting. I don't have to remove pins as I'm moving. So with that in mind, I'm just going to bring this to, I've already ironed my backing nice and smooth. And if that bothers you to put, a, a, the iron is pretty warm at this point to go through all the layers. If that bothers you to have your iron against, again, Santa's beard and that metallic, just put that pressing cloth down. It's very thin. And now we're going to iron all the layers together. One of the reasons we decided to put all the layers together and then do the machine uh, applique is because it helps quilt it. A lot of times when you're doing a quilt block, let's say you're doing a block of the month, you'll piece that together and you will use your thread set to do the machine applique, but the batting and the backing aren't there. For our project and for all 12 of them, we always layered the top, the batting, fusible fleece and backing, and then did the machine uh, applique. So it has this beautiful embossed look and it has this quilting. You can kind of see that. That's because we did all three layers together before we start the process. So if you, again, are a seasoned uh, quilter and you're used to doing the machine applique without batting, without backing, you're right. And this is the only reason we opted to do that is, oh, and I need to do this from the backside, right? Because my, I think my iron, yes, is still turned down from when we were doing fusible. I forgot to turn that up. That's fine. We'll just flip this over. No problem. This thing will heat up. I'll let this iron heat up all the way. I'm going to get this iron together. And now we'll get to start doing some of our uh, machine applique. Big quilts, I send them out. I'm not an accomplished a long arm quilter by any means. But a project like this is very fun to be able to do on your own machine yourself. So I definitely want to take you through that journey. Okay, once that's done, we feel our layers are really put together. And that's stuck just because there's, that is a double sided fusible on there. Let me get that off. Okay, here's our top. And now we are ready to say, all right, where do I want to start this? Now, you could really start anywhere. I've heard people say you start in the middle and kind of work your way out. Some people say start wherever you want to start, whatever your preference might be. I told you about two of the metallic threads that are part of our thread set. I want to dive into that because it takes a little bit more care to work with metallic thread. Now, if I was just doing, if there was no metallics in here, the only extra needle I'd be buying would be the super nonstick size 8012. That needle is engineered specifically for fusible products. Heat and bond, steam and seam, whatever's out there. It's, it's specifically meant to go through fusible. Because we do have two metallics, both a silver and a gold, one of the other needles, and that's what's actually loaded in my machine right now, is a Schmetz metallic needle. My best sewing days with metallic thread are coupled up with what's called a thread director. So if you are going to be getting this thread set and if you've had any issues with breakage, this section is specifically for you. I have recorded a completely separate video on this product, but I'm gonna cover it now so you don't have to go watch that other video. So the thread director, if you look at the thread, let's just open up this spool here. Basically what happens with thread, metallic thread, it's more delicate, easier to break, and I've definitely had breakage. That's just a part of the deal. However, there are new products on the market to help minimize that, starting out with the Schmetz metallic needle in the sewing machine with a smoother eye, less likely to provide friction and break the thread at the needle, right, at the eye of the needle. Now let's look at this thread. As we pop the end open and we take this out,
Let's look at how the thread is actually wound on the spool. It starts to give you a clue of why the thread director helps you be successful. It's through the twisting action of thread. I'm just going to trim all that off real quick and get that out of our way. So we're not dealing with that. If you look at this thread, it comes off as a ribbon. The problem with having it here and pulling it off is it's going to start this twist. The thread director, which will work with any sewing machine, I'm just going to install that here. In the Bernina, this just pivots up. On the machines that I have at home, uh, I've got an older one that I started with, a Singer. It kind of has a spool pin holder. If that's you, put that in your machine. This is a single thread director. They also make dual thread directors. So if you like to sew with a twin needle, there's a thread director for you as well that will hold two spools, one at each end, and I've used them. And you thread a single needle or two needles. It's amazing, depending on what you want to do with it. So your spool pin is up, and you have an opening here, both at the top, and these, these tighten, these loosen and tighten. So as I put this onto the machine, I'm just going to tighten this. We want our thread to go on. We have a little bit of a stopper at the end. What this does, and we're going to try to get a close up, watch how the thread is coming off in a natural orientation and there's no twisting happening. That's the first part of the key to the success of using metallic. So as we look at our project, we certainly want to start Probably, like don't start here. You're going to want to start here so you can go all the way around and stop here. And then you'll go do the cuffs. And you, while you've got that thread loaded, you'll want to use that until that's exhausted. So we'll come to our location where we want to begin. And let's get started. Sewing very close to the edge. You back stitch just a touch here. I'm going to turn my speed way down here. I can already see it sewing too fast. That's another thing I have discovered about sewing with metallic thread. If you're one of those people that's pedal to the metal, <laughs> not when you're sewing with metallic thread. Definitely slow down because that too is leading to too much friction and is more likely to break the thread. The other thing I've done is I've stepped down actually the tension on my machine. You want to practice on some scrap fabric. I have a slightly longer stitch length at 2.75. And really kind of the tension or pressure is down to 2.75 as well. Notice I stop and I pivot, get turned in the direction I want to, to turn in, and then sew again. That reduces the side load on the thread. And look how beautiful that is. Look at that beautiful shine. It's amazing. It's an amazing combination, the Schmetz needle and the thread director. And of course, we'll stitch this, change our thread to red, change our thread to green, and stitch everything down. I'll go ahead and get that stitched down. When we come back, we're going to talk about trimming up our project, adding our binding, adding our craft holder in the back, and finishing up our project. So now that the project is quilted, we're ready to trim our background. So I just, again, put it on the spinning mat so I can say, all right, I, I, we put on two inch borders. So I'm going to grab our two and a half by 12 and a half, whatever ruler you want. I'm going to line that up along my one and three quarter here, should, which theoretically should run right along the edge of that. Scoot that up just a touch and I'll make a cut here. And I love that part, like I said before, of not having to lift up the project, right? Just keep it on the mat, turn, and again, I'm going to line up with what, where this should be is three quarters, two, one and three quarters, right along this line right here. You could see that. 
And you can see that some of my border is diving down just a little bit beneath that, maybe a sixteenth of an inch. It's okay. Our binding is going to go on next and cover all that up. The goal is to square this up as, well, as squarely as possible, right? That's why it's called squaring up versus trying to follow these lines. Don't, don't chase that. So I'm going to lay that down. I'm looking for kind of almost the average, I would say. Sometimes when you do the quilting, it kind of draws it all up. And that's just a natural part of the quilting process. And that's very normal. So you see what I'm saying? How here I see just border and now it's dipped down just a little bit. No worries. Don't let that even give you any heartache whatsoever. Let's rotate and we'll trim two more times. Lining this up. And one more cut. Okay, now we have a square block. We have our kind of quilt sandwich. Now, what are we going to do? Of course, you know this if you're an experienced quilter, but maybe you're not, you're like, I don't know what's next. I just know you can't have these raw edges. That's what, this is called the binding on a quilt. So in your kit, you'll be getting a piece of fabric on uh, this darling stripe, also from Riley Blake. And you'll use your ruler. I love to use the two and a half by 24 and a half inch because the strips are cut to two and a half inch. That's what we prefer to cut uh, ours to accomplished quilters and other people who like a little bit of a narrower binding might cut to two and a quarter. For me, I like to sew my binding down by machine. I like a little bit more binding going to the back. Um, and so I do cut my strips with this to two and a half. You'll need two of those strips and you want to join those strips. This has already been folded in half, but let me unfold this. So you're kind of seeing we had a join in here. Um, I'm going to show you that. So you can see here, we just had one strip, two strips, and you can see the pattern of the fabric has a repeat, right? I have a pink stripe, a mint green, and then a red and a darker green, and this repeat. So when you, when you join the strips, you want to be very intentional where when they are placed right side together, which is all this was, we cut off the selvage on those ends, positioned that so that the repeat would kind of continue. And then we sewed a quarter inch seam allowance and pressed the seam open. That's what you're seeing here. Because you wouldn't want this to be green stripe, green stripe, right? When you can clearly see there, the pattern of the fabric doesn't go green stripe, green stripe. It's green, pink. You get the idea. So now you simply fold that in half and press all the way down. On both ends, I've got the selvage. We're just going to trim that away. And it's nice if it's a nice square edge because we're going to join them. I'm going to teach you a binding technique that is very easy for beginners, a very reliable way. There's lots of ways to do binding. So this is just one way to do binding. We have other tutorials we filmed. Be sure to check those out if you're curious. But this is a, the simplest way to do binding that really a beginner can be successful too. So now when we join our, when we start our binding, we want to leave a big, we, you have a lot of extra binding. Okay, so let me just show you what I'm talking about. If we kind of run this around the perimeter of our project, you're going to have a lot of extra binding. So don't worry about leaving a big open, what we kind of call almost a tail, right? Don't, don't worry about that being open for quite some distance. I want to probably start down in this area. We're going to sew around and stop here so we have almost one whole side open. You're going to see why that's important. So I'm just going to leave that about here. Maybe we'll start right there where my finger is. That's a great starting spot. And this is where I really love to use my wonder clips. 
It's just, you could use these pins by all means. That by all means, you could do it. I just think the Wonder Clips, the, this is kind of their mission. This is what they're supposed to do. So we're going to get started. I might even clip it up here. And we're just going to get started. Now, again, binding is a whole nother and separate thing. This isn't necessarily a learn to quilt. So I'm going to go into detail. But if you are like, I have never done binding, check out the binding series and you're going to see the options you have and pick your favorite. You can practice. I'm going to stop my stitch a quarter inch from the end, which is about right there. And I'm going to back stitch. I'm just going to put these two marks in and you're going to see why they come into play. So I'm just going to get started. I'm going to start sewing back stitch, stop and back stitch. And then we're going to what's called miter the corner. That's what's happening right down in here. And then I'm going to come back around and we will get our binding sewn on. So we're at our machine. We'll stitch a quarter inch seam. I'll start back stitch. Stitch to our line, which is a quarter inch from the end. We'll stop and we'll cut our thread and we'll miter that corner together. Let's back up one more time and we're going to cut. Okay, I want you to see this where you will lay the fabric back. See how that's created a 45 degree angle and the visual plane of the border kind of keeps going with the binding. Now we lay this back on top of itself, just like that. I want you to see that. So it's kind of flush with the end, and now we're traveling in a different direction. This is called a mitered corner. I'm going to grab a, another clip just to act as another pair of hands for me, kind of out here. But I'm going to start sewing right off the edge onto the fabric with a quarter inch seam. You're lining up with that nice clean edge, just laying that down as you go. When you believe you're about a quarter of an inch, back stitch. Rip, I went forward one. And let's cut our thread. I lay that back at the 45. We see our, it's as if that binding strip was a continuation of the border. See, I could be like this and like this. No, here. Once you have that, trap that with your fingers. You start moving back down in the other direction. You're traveling. You just made a 90 degree pivot. Clip that if you want to. As long as it doesn't get in the way of your presser foot. And let's start going again. you get the idea. On our last row, I'm going to take that clip out. We're going to sew and really kind of stop in this area and we're going to talk about how, how do we join this? What is this? How do we join these strips? <laughs> okay, so this one, just like we've done, pivot back. Clip that. Clip that out of the way. There we go. And 
Now I'm going to cut my thread here and we'll take it over to the mat because now we need to figure out how do we join this? How does this go together? So we'll take it over. I want to see, show you from the overhead and then we will come back and get some close-ups and actually sew the binding on together. So let's look at what we have here. We'll trim our corners. We've got a nice job of mitering, but that join, don't let that scare you. So we will, I like to do it right on my pressing mat. So it's right handy. So let's look at that. So we left this nice and open and basically where this tail where we started ends and where this ends have to be joined. So the simplest way to do this is to lay this right along the edge at about the halfway distance. And I'm going to press into that hard, really hard. I want a nice crease in that. Similarly, along this edge, laying this down, it's where it meets it, where it would naturally meet it. And I will press again very hard. So there's no question that when I open this fabric up, I can see these creases. That's why we're pressing in very intentionally. Just press strong. Okay. This extra fabric can go away because it's not helping us right now. It's just kind of more fabric to, to frankly deal with. And this fabric is, is extra, but we can deal with this later. So let's think about this. We know that we need to sew things right side together. So the question is, when we have these, these folds that we pressed in very intentionally, that, that fold, see how, because, of the, because this is folded in half, when I create press the fold in. Let me get this one out of the way. So we're just looking at this right now. We'll press here hard once. And we already know we have a good strong press and you can see how they meet, but they have to be joined. We know we have to have fabric joined with right sides together. That's not optional. So the question is, if we fold this in half and we line up our folds, if you can envision that, see those folds? And now we pin that and sew that, will that ultimately be correct? Yes. Here's one thing I've learned how to do. I just clip this together and just, so I'm not battling that. So now the only thing I'm worried about is just stacking this on top of that fold. See how it's right there? Let's pin that. And down here on this end, those are lined up. And pinned. You just want to keep track of that visual crease. Let's go sew straight along there right now. Make sure everything's smooth, there's no tucks. Keep an eye on that uh, fold there, crease I should say. You can see it just right there. Okay, let's go see what we've done. Nobody's trimming anything. <laughs> I've made that mistake of like, oh, I'm, I'm sure this is right. Well, not always. Let's look and see. Look at that, that came out beautifully. That will, once it's trimmed away, lay down there. So you want to always check your work. Make sure you didn't take an inadvertent twist. You can do a little bit of a press here. 
Actually, let's just trim that away. It's nice when it's pressed open. It lays better. Now it's folded right back over. I'm taking this to the machine. I'm going to continue stitching this on. Okay, binding is on. Yes, we love that. All right, now what's next? This hanging sleeve is next. So the hanging sleeve is needed. Let's look at the back of the project real quick so you can see why this is an important function. Whether you want to use the craft stand for the table or the French curl, the sleeve is what will be sliding through your hanging sleeve to support that for display in either style. Easy to do. Our instructions will guide you into taking a portion of your binding fabric. You have a small piece here. We like to use our hot ruler. We'll just measure up a quarter of an inch. The hot ruler means exactly what it says. It can accept heat, endless heat. You can't, you almost can't destroy these things. I love them. You will just fold over that edge a quarter of an inch. You get that actually going straight. I think that I had a little crooked. And you know what? If it's a little more than the quarter of an inch, that's fine. It's not a problem. We just want it to be even. You don't want the hanging sleeve crooked or the project will hang a little bit potentially crooked. So that's why we want to be very intentional about folding that edge uh, over the same amount, whether that's a little bit uh, at a quarter or a little bit over, doesn't matter. Just make it even. All right. Once that's done, the ends, the two ends will fold in a half of an inch with our hot ruler. And again, press on both ends. And we will stitch that down with an eighth inch seam. That's the portion on the back here. I'll show you real quick that again so you're seeing what I'm doing here. The bottom has gotten tucked under by a quarter. That's the part we folded under first. These two ends are here, and the raw edge gets trapped up here, which we'll be doing next once I get this stitched down. Let's fold that one back under. Okay, so I'm just going to take this to the machine. I will sew here, right along here, and on that, and then our hanging sleeve will be ready to sew into the project, and we'll secure the binding around it.
beautiful. Okay, set that aside for just a moment. On the back of our project, we will measure down. Let me just check my notes here. I believe we're measuring down two inches. Yes, we're measuring down two inches and we're going to make a mark. So we'll use the, this side of our ruler because we have our two inches right here. Lay that at the very top. And our hanging sleeve is really kind of centered in between, so you don't have to draw a line all the way. It's just kind of a guide that we will use. And it's longer than our uh, hanging sleeve. And that's because it's going to have a little bit of a tuck here. But to start off with, we're just centering it about the same distance from both ends. And we're going to sew that on with a eighth inch seam allowance. Don't go to a full quarter. Remember, our binding is back here. We don't want that. So it's, it's just to kind of hold it in place until the binding can wrap around. So we'll be securing that. Now with that mark that we made, we'll just grab needle and thread. I have the um, Richard Hemming embroidery needles, anything you have really. You can just grab the red from your thread set and we tuck the bottom to meet that line. That's what creates this little bit of a gap to allow the sleeve to fit there. You could certainly pin that in place if you'd like. So it's not going anywhere and it's nice and even. And maybe just one more. Now with needle and thread, there's really not a way to do this by machine because of course, that would be going to the front of the project. Now we just do a little bit of a whip stitch. I come in, I generally hide my stitch in the back, do a couple knots, going shallow to make sure I'm not coming to the front. I'll let that edge come down just a little bit there. And then I just start a whip stitch. I'm just picking up that edge. Keep in mind, people are, shouldn't be looking at the back of your project, right? They should be so in love with what's on the front of the project, they're not even thinking about what's on the back. So we just travel down, going shallow to not catch. I'm just going through the back and the batting, or fusible fleece, depending on what you're using, but not going to the front. You get the idea. This is just secured by hand. So I'll secure that all the way down. Do a couple more stitches. All the way down. It actually goes very fast. I'm just going to put that in here knowing you get the idea. I travel across here, tie a couple knots, tie off, trim, I'm done. Once that's complete, that's when the binding rolls over to the back. You know, the binding that we were uh, careful to get on there. And that's when this clips to the back. Notice how it has a nice uh, fold over. And I talked about cutting the strips to two and a half instead of some people like two and a quarter. That's what it does for you. By having a bigger amount on the back, in fact, I'll just clip some in place with my Wonder Clips. Ultimately, I would be sewing that down from the front if I was using this by sewing it down by machine. Or if you're going to be sewing this down and whip stitching it just like this, you would have the clip be with the color side up on the back. So if you're going to hand stitch, I would have the colors up so it's flat like this. 
But in our instance, we did ours by machine. Knowing that I'm ultimately going to be sewing from this side and that a wonder clip has a different profile. It's flat on the bottom and has this scoop on the top. It's better when you're going to be sewing by machine to have the flat side so it, fly, it, it rides along your table of your sewing machine. So knowing that I will ultimately sew this binding down by machine, by stitching in this gap here, I'm gonna have the clips here. But this is the point. This is where the wonder clips come in. In the corner here, I take a little fold and I fold it back to mimic the miter here to the miter here. And you can clip that with a wonder clip and kind of hold that in place. And I'm gonna actually flip that over because I am sewing that from the front. Flip this one over. And you get the idea. You just keep bringing this over. In fact, let me just, let me just clip it. And then when I come back, I want you to see what that looks like from the top when you get ready to sew it down by machine. Let's look at the top here. This is where your binding goes and covers up this whole raw edge at the top. That's why you have to sew the binding on first, not roll it to the back and put the hanging sleeve. You could absolutely just put the hanging sleeve on and then put the binding on, that would work. But this, this sequence works really nice to uh, put, secure the binding as we did, put the hanging sleeve on, and then wrap that binding around to the back. So we're almost completely clipped with the Wonder Clips. Invaluable. I'll tell you when I, I was kind of dragging my feet for many years to get the, the, the clips. I was, I was, I was doing good to afford a sewing machine, let alone all the extra goodies. And I would pin all my bindings and poke all myself with a needle every time and, uh, with the, all the pins. And I, when I finally invested in these Wonder Clips, I'm like, why didn't I do this about three years ago? <laughs> so I think once you get these, if you don't have them, you'll love them. You'll find a lot of, a lot of reasons. Okay, let's flip this over. So here we can see now our binding is around the edge it's covering up our little quilt sandwich, as we said. And as before, we can put either the, I'd probably put blue actually in my machine and stitch close to that edge, which would, and I'd probably put red in the bobbin so that, you know, you're not seeing a different color. Probably blue on the top, red on the bobbin. You could certainly be using your thread set for that to stitch that down. And I don't have that, those colors, but I will still show you this process. Just you get the idea if you are going to do this by machine. And if you're going to use it by hand, you just whip stitch it like we did the hanging sleeve. No problem. All right, let me get my thread going. I'm going to try to roll, since I've got red in here, and I don't want a red thread showing on the blue, I'm going to roll this binding and kind of open up that gap. It's called stitch in the ditch. And I'm trying to stitch very closely. So when the fabric relaxes, it rolls back over and you don't see the thread. I'll just stitch a short distance and we can see how that looks. I'll just do that real quick and look at this with you. And you can see when the, it rolls back, you can't see that thread. You can do this with red. Just go slow. Notice how slow I was like, it's slow. And I caught this on the back. It would obviously look a lot better with red thread. But I mean, again, people shouldn't be looking at the back of their project because they're so enamored with the front. You get the idea of just stitching around this with blue or whatever color you want. And then of course, you're releasing the Wonder Clips as you go. 
We have a special embellishment on here, and that, of course, is our darling Jingle Bell. So for our final chapter, we're talking about just a little bit of the hand embroidery we couldn't resist adding. Starting off with our February project, our Cupid, of course, needs to have some stitchery for his bow of love he's shooting. If you really don't want to do that, you could certainly use a permanent micron pen and draw that on. We have a little bit more embroidery going on in our March project, and that was our French knot for the eye of our sweet little duck. And then lastly, in our April project, our bumblebee gnome has his antenna. So very simple, a back stitch in front's knots. I have two strands of embroidery floss. So when you get your skein, you're just gonna wanna pull out a length that's about that length. It's almost kind of from the end of your hand to your shoulder is a good measurement and make a cut. In fact, let me just show you that real quick. This has six strands wrapped together. They're kind of twisted together. You can see that as I separate them. The, the best way to separate these, you're going to want to use two. Pull out one at a time to avoid creating a bit of a bird's nest, kind of a knot. Notice as I pull this, it starts to untwist. That's normal. See that happen? It seems that if I kind of work the twisting out slowly, it really works out well. Let me get these out of the way just so you don't have to look so much at that. And then I do it again. And you don't have to go at snail space. Just know that you need to kind of smooth that out and get the two that you want. All right, you get the idea. Bring the two ends together, thread your needle. I'm using the Richard Hemming size four. They're just a couple dollars per package. One pack's gonna list, I mean, you can see we've used this over and over. One pack will last you a decade if you don't lose them. I threaded that and I have a knot in the end. We'll come up with our back stitch. With the back stitch, the whole goal here is to look like it's just this perfectly smooth curve but you're doing it with straight lines. So you'll come up and you'll come down about less than a quarter of an inch with the needle splitting the line. You want to keep that as your goal every single time. That distance, you wanna generally keep that distance unless you're doing a really tight turn and you might have to shorten that. But I'm gonna try to keep that same distance and I, when I come up, I'm gonna try to split that line. Notice I have to kind of fish for it sometimes don't give up on that. Stay in that. Don't let it, don't, you don't want to be to the left and to the right of the line or your line won't be straight. Makes sense. Then we go back down. And then we come up, split the line. About right there. And we come back thus the name backstitch. This is easily one of the most common, if not the most common, embroidery stitch. It's very useful whenever you want to have a stem or outline something. It's a great option for you. Come out, come back down. This is the backstitch. To end that stitch, let's say I'm down here and I wanna just end it, I flip it over. Just go shallow under where you just stitched. I tie off at least twice, because we don't want that to come undone. And then I would uh, trim. For the French knots, let me knot this again, another classic, absolutely classic embroidery stitch. By the way, we have guides and books and all kinds of lovely resources for you. If you wanna learn about other embroidery stitches, we'll try to have those uh, listed here for you to find. The French knot, you're going to come up 
This is for the eye of our chick. I'm going to hold the embroidery floss to my left. I'm right-handed. My needle is horizontal. And we're going to do, I think, two wraps. Let's try one time around, two times around. And we pivot the needle to go right back down where we came up. Notice the tension I'm creating with my left hand. I'm not letting go of this. I'm not letting this go until I have to. That controls that and it doesn't let a knot form too soon. So let me show you this again. You come up. Embroidery floss to the left. Needles horizontal in front of this. Wrap around once. Wrap around twice. Pivot. Needle is going back in where it came from. Down. I've trapped that. Oh, you can see my fabric opened up. That's okay. We'll make this work. And let it go. And now you have a French knot. That's all there is to French knots. And generally, of course, you're, you've got the chick applique. So you've got all kinds of things where you can, again, you're kind of tying off in the fabric itself back there. Remembering you've got the batting and all kinds of things that are kind of buffering this and you're just going to tie off again twice and now you're done. And that is all there is for the embroidery in our gnome is where the heart is club. So you can see the steps in making the gnome is where the heart is, is attainable by a beginner. So if you've been that one that left us that message, again, thank you for engaging with us in social media. We take your comments to heart. We talk about it. Um, we want to make you happy as our customers. So hopefully this early knowledge of how the project goes together from very beginning all the way through um, has been helpful. We know this is a much longer video, uh, but hopefully helpful. The most important thing, I said it before, I'm gonna say it again, get your spot. Because we were collecting fabrics for literally years, I just can't add, we can't add to this program. Get your spot, your thread set, any notions you saw me use, you're like, oh yeah, I need that. And be sure to subscribe to YouTube. You never want to miss out what's coming your way. So much on the horizon. We're here for you and I'll see you soon on another video.